Welcome to Keys Dive Guide, Volume 27, Ghost Ships of the 1733 Fleet. With guest star, Captain Finley Ricard. What about the ghost ships of the 1733 Spanish Armada? A ghost ship is a vessel that has remained undiscovered through the centuries, her secrets lost in the sands of time. The only ship to survive the 1733 hurricane and make it back to Cadiz, Spain, was Senor San Joseph, nicknamed El Africa, a 500-ton Spanish-built ship. There are two shipwrecks listed on the old Spanish chart that have yet to be located by modern salvers. The first one, number 18, Nuestra Senora del Rosario y San Fernando, was an Italian-built ship displacing 328 tons. The San Fernando is positioned near present-day Grassy Key on the old Spanish chart. The second ship, number 19, San Ignacio de Urquijo, was an English-built vessel displacing 292 tons. The San Ignacio is positioned near present-day Marathon on the old chart. Also, there was a situado or supply ship mentioned. This vessel is more than likely La Floridana, a 187-ton British-built ship captured by the Spanish in 1722. Bound from Havana to the growing Spanish colony of St. Augustine, La Floridana was laden with farming and military supplies along with the military payroll. She is more than likely the ship that disintegrated over the shallows of Coffin's Patch, a wreck trail we'll visit in the next episode of Key's Dive Guide. There were also two major ships on the Manifest of Vessels that were never seen again. Lost and never found were Lost Dolores, nicknamed the New London, an English-built ship displacing 296 tons, and El Rosario, or the Rosary, a French-built vessel displacing 205 tons. Furthermore, some accounts report over a dozen ships departed Havana with the Armada that were not recorded on the official list of vessels. All of these ships were swallowed up by the angry ocean in water possibly hundreds of feet deep, disintegrating through the centuries, untouched by mortal man, their vast treasures entombed. Meet my friend, Captain Finley Ricard. Absolutely gorgeous. Now, this, this here has been... As assistant dockmaster and dive guide for Finley's Atlantis Marina in the mid-1970s, Finley taught me all the diving and navigation skills necessary to document the Florida Keys reef line. He sold me a 1973 Chevrolet van and the Checkered Demon, the rig that made the Florida Keys dive odyssey possible and the Checker Demon's still running. <laughs> yeah, this brought you a lot of luck. It sure has. Finley also showed me my first galleon, La Almiranta, featured in volume 23 of the Keys Dive Guide YouTube channel. He taught me how to use shore bearings and ranges to relocate specific dive sites in the days before GPS technology. Shore bearings, when used properly, will put the navigator right on top of a shipwreck, even with near zero water visibility. Finley has been salvaging Spanish shipwrecks since the late 1960s and made some interesting recoveries near the Bay of Honda G marker. These recoveries lead Finley to believe a ghost galleon, possibly from the 1733 fleet, rests seaward of the Bay of Honda Bridge, or even in the shallows near the Spanish Harbor Keys. Well, there's a, a couple of ships, of Spanish sh ships off of Big Pine Key that hasn't been uh, publicly found, but they are known to the existence. In fact, there was one off of American Shoals, and uh, 
there's a few people around that knows where the bottom of that vessel is. And this is not off of that particular wreck, but it is a wreck similar to that. And it's outside of the boundaries of the government, which soon will not be. Well, this is a, a line gun. It's what they used to shoot a line from one ship to the other, or either to the shore. And that line is tied onto a hawser, which is a larger line. And they pull that small line over, and then the large line, they tie it to the ship or whatever they're going to tie with it. And that's why it's called a line gun. Did they fire projectiles with this gun no. as well? Well, the projectile only was attached to a small cord, or it was attached to a larger line. That's why I call it a line gun. Yes. I imagine in a if they had to and somebody was fixing to bear down on them, they'd throw nails in it if they had them available to put down in it and shoot at you. This is a touch hole where you put powder down in it and you light that powder and that sets off the charge that's inside of it. So this probably came off the Manila fleet? Yeah. Boy, it's a beautiful gun. Okay, that's a similar usage this gun here is. It's also a line gun, but they used it also on the bow and stern of the ships, which they would sink or shoot at the Indians coming out at them at night or something like that, or somebody aggressively coming toward their boats with the smaller or vessels. Was it like a, on a swivel? Could they swivel it down? And yeah, this, uh, if you notice, you've got this turned upside down. These trunnions are near the bottom, so it balances it. Like then the touch hole is right here. Touch hole's here? Yes. See where it's grooved out here? And pour the powder in this, and it would funnel it down into the... Well, and, and it would fire a projectile about the circumference circumference of this, so uh, what would it be, about a two pounder? About a, about a two inch in diameter, and it would go approximately two to three miles. <laughs> I mean, it, it carried quite a distance, and it's heavily built so they could put a lot of powder in it. To, and they, they'd also use it for a signal gun, like they would fire it into the certain place, and it would create a confusion there, either smoke or splash water or something, and they would know that some ships are coming. They use it for signals, they use it for firing a line, and they use it also for protection. But they actually did forge round iron balls that goes in these. I had a pair of these exactly alike. Well, not exactly. One of them was, they looked alike, but one of them was four inches shorter than this, and the iron swivel was still on the bottom of it and attached was a piece of the wood. Whoa. I mean, it was absolutely gorgeous. Now, th this here has been in chemicals for over 15 years. This could be any, this could be any, any date, early 1600s uh, to late 1700s. Right. It's more than likely in the early 1700s. Maybe even off the 1733 plate fleet. Yeah. It could possibly be this off of that 1733 that hasn't been formally found around here. But there's also another anchor out in the waters near here that's where the ring here is large enough that you can swim through it. Like a 20 footer, like the Larry anchor yeah. out in front of Coburn Marina. It's just about 20 feet tall. Uh, judging from the size of this, this would probably be a stern anchor, wouldn't it? Well, it, it, I would guess it probably would be one of the stern anchors trying to hold it back from going onto the reef. It's not a major anchor. It surely suffered some stress right now. Well, there was a cannon laying right across there when it, we found it. That's where the cannon, the electrolysis of the cannon ate into the anchor. It also ate the end of the cannon off. You notice how that cannon that I showed you was it dissolved right near the end. The right, end of it was right. laying right the across The end of it there. was right on it. Yeah. And this was out near G Marker. Yeah. Naturally, the wood stock was gone. Oh, of course. And there was uh, several coins found around it, too. 
silver coins. Silver coins. A few gold from, coins. Yeah. And there were several large anchors, I mean, large cannons found there. That's impressive. That's fun of treasure hunting. That's right. Don, it's good to see you again, buddy. It's good to see you, pal. For sure. You want to go diving sometime, we'll still do it. I do. I most certainly do. There's still some real good spots around. Without a doubt, dozens of galleons containing billions in treasure are cleverly concealed by the sands and coral of time in the waters of the Florida Keys.